Welcome to the first uh, afternoon session. Um, really looking forward to this session. The first speaker uh, for the session is Colin Ewald from uh, Zurich. And I think he's going to tell us something about one of the missing hallmarks, which is obviously the extracellular matrix changes. Uh, Colin, are you there? So I can leave it like this, right? The sharing. Can you hear me, Colin? Yes, I can hear you. Great. We can also hear you. Perfect. And we uh, see your slides also. This is amazing. Thanks. So, so I go ahead or? Yes, go ahead, please. Whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about exome matrix modeling during aging, but first I have to um, say matriculation of conflict of interest. So I'm advisor of Maximum, which is a long charity startup builder. And they just built one of the first uh, companies called Avea, which I'm a co-founder of. However, I have an academic lab at ETH Zurich, and one of the questions we ask here is, can we extend lifespan close to death? Which is a very important question, because if you want to treat like elderly people, right, we need to know that these interventions work. And so to do get some proof concept, we use the model organism C. elegans, shown here, which lives around for 25 days shown here. So this is the survival curve. And so the question we ask is that population when 25% are still alive or 75% are dead, can we extend the lifespan of CR again, right? And to do this, we had to uh, generate a new genetic tool or update a genetic tool called oxygen degradation. And we tag the incinite GF1 receptor DAF2 and CR again, uh, with this um, auxin, uh, with this dagron. And what we can do with that is when we treat animals with auxin, it's a plant hormone, um, the Cargans eats it and then it degrades the insulin at your front receptor within like half an hour to an hour. It's almost, com it's gone to, there are only 40% left of the levels. And so this is the first um, indication that we actually can degrade transmembrane proteins. So now we re-engineered C. elegans and where we applied auxin. And we did this at day 10 of adulthood. And so again, in black is shown untreated animals. When we at day 10 of adulthood, we treat down with auxin, it degrades the insulin at your receptor and it increases the lifespan. It almost doubles the lifespan of these animals. And this is a very nice indication because other interventions like RNA interference work up to day six of adulthood. So this is pretty cool. And so then we ask, well, what happens if we go at day 21 of adulthood, right? So when 75% um, of the population is dead. And so what I want you to point out here is that at uh, day 21 of adulthood, if we don't treat the animals, um, they live another four days. So at 25, they're dead. Now, Trommel, so when we treated the animals with oxen and degraded the insulin receptor, we were able to double the lifespan, at least of some animals, which was pretty amazing to us. So instead of living another four days till they died, some of them lived another 26 days. So this was pretty cool. And it's the first indication that we can double the lifespan of an, in the, of an animal at the end of their lifespan. And also it raises multiple new questions, which we're trying to ask. So those animals close to death, right? Is the intervention just slowing aging extremely so they can live longer? Is it actually reversing aging, right? Could be the reversal going on and then they age again. And so these questions we're trying to address now, and I'm happy to collaborate with anybody who's interested in, I'm happy to send the worms and they can try their favorite assays to see maybe is reversal of accumulation of damage, DNA damage, protein damage, whatever. So um, shoot me an email if you want to. So next question in our lab, what we ask is, what is actually the downstream mechanism of, for example, reduced incident HF1 signaling or other conserved interventions like cholagia um, restriction, reduced TOR signaling, reduced protein translation, or just improved mitochondrial function, right? And to do this, we use an omics approach where we look, uh, we look at transcriptomics. And basically what we know is from uh, mice and C. elegans, the different interventions, there are a couple of things that come up in, in uh, downstream. 
of these interventions like better stress resistance, DNA uh, repair, damage repair, proteostasis, so improved immune system. So then uh, credits to my lab, see what he done, he compared long lift CR against to normal lift or the same thing, long lift mice to normal lift mice used published available microarray or RNA sequencing data, data went to the raw data, reanalyzed the whole thing, done lots of in silico analysis, which I don't have time to talk about it. But one thing that came out was one of the top term were remodeling of XR matrix. So all these different inventions start to remodel the XR matrix in CR against and in mice. And what does this mean, right? What is the XR matrix here for? And so in a very simplistic manner, the XR matrix is for tissue protection. So the tissue is surrounded by collagens or for tissue tissue signaling. Right, And so if you look at uh, a textbook example where you have, this is the cell membrane, here's the outside, the collagens and fibronectin and integrin that link these exome matrix to the inside acting skeleton. What we know is that at least in human skin, that the collagen content declines uh, 1% per year. So when you're 20, you have a lot of collagen in the skin and that declines when you're 80. And we found similar effects in a mouse skin aging. So this is a Herichi staining that stains collagen one and three um, in young mice three months old or in 24 months old. And we see a decline in collagen content. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that because every tissue ages differently. Every tissue has another exome matrix and we see a other difference in exome matrix changes depending on tissue and mice. So then we ask like, what is the global role of exome matrix changes, right? And so the way we address this was we actually um, done whole mouse transcriptomics and proteomics. So really we realize the whole mouse to, um, to the little, um, com you know, little parts we were able to. And then we looked doing, uh, either doing aging. And what we found on the transcriptomic and proteomic level is there's actually certain collagen, like collagen type one and three, they increase with age. We confirmed that by Western blotting. And these collagens are, you see them usually happening in fibrosis a lot, right? And so we asked them, well, can we, is that reversed in longevity interventions? So when we took mice that were 15 months old, we either dietary restricted them or treated them rapamycin and then har harvested the, the organs or the skin for this example when they're 30 months old. And with exome matrix um, proteomics, uh, we found actually that either caloric restriction or rapamycin treatment suppress collagen one and three, right? And so, so rewarding that which we effect we see during aging. And we think actually it's a little bit more complicated, but we think there's a remodeling of the exome matrix, but why is there remodeling going on? And one thing you have to know is that collagen start to cross-link with age. And so this is, an essay where we use a lot in the lab and the other labs have used that too, where we use the tail tandem of mice, uh, which are basically collagens and these collagens become cross-linked with age. And so when you look how, um, how long they take to break, the more crossing they are, the more time it takes. And so three months old, six, 12 or four, uh, uh, 24 months old, this is like a rhythmic cell, just takes longer time. So chesting, there's more cross-linking going on, accumulation of cross-linking during aging. Now, when we ask now in our regime, when we add a tire, restrict or treat the mice with we see actually that they slow this um, um, cross-linking. So here are mice at ten, uh, the tandems of 10 months old, you see a nice increase to 28 months old, and then this increase in, um, in rupture time is actually planted with rapamycin or actually uh, down by caloric restriction or a combination caloric restriction with rapamycin. So uh, suggesting that uh, these interventions also act on the exocellular matrix level. And we see something similar in C. elegans where we um, take either young day two animals, uh, eight when they right before they die or day 12 where they're almost dead in that lifespan curve, either wild type or long-lived clip one animals and have a threat sense in one of these collagens. And what you see is this is the threat sensor at day two of adulthood. So the cooler column means the threat sensor is further apart. 
And then just with aging, the threat sensor comes closer together. And that could suggest there's a cross-linking of the matrix going on or some other events. However, we can quantify this by the threat sensor increase with age, and that's blunted in long lived animals, suggesting again that these longevity interventions act also on the exome matrix level. So what has the exome matrix stiffness to do with uh, longevity? And we've done a screen and I'm just making this in a very short slide. What we found actually in the screen is that the exoskeleton of the organs, which is the cuticle, um, there is a mechanosensor linker that goes way through to the muscle. So this linker goes through the hypodermis the basement membrane, which is another external matrix to the muscle, right? And during aging, this link weakens in some parts, especially for this uh, perlicant. And then this whole sensing from the exoskeleton to the muscle is lost and this attention forces. And that completely blocks uh, longevity. And so, um, what we think is going on overall is that the H cell produces its own extracellular matrix, collagen synthesized, they're laid out, and around one third of your total protein mass are collagens. Now, there's, there's a feedback from the inside, from the outside in again, saying we need more extracellular matrix, we less, we need some remodeling. And when something is broken, the only way to repair it is to cut it out degrade it and synthesize new ones. And so the synthesis we see on the transcriptional level, as I've shown you, and we call this mechanism ECM homeostasis. And basically this is a mechanism that works very well when young, but it declines of course during aging and longevity interventions just prolong these interventions. And so coming back to our key questions, are there any underscore longevity mechanism? And yes, we think so. So there's, ECM homeostasis going on, which we could not understand yet, but we are in the middle to explore it further. But can we use uh, this signature of ECM homeostasis actually for drug discovery? So this was our next big question. And when we look at different drugs that extend lifespan in monoorganism from yeast, sea organs, flies, mice, rats, and here these are clinical trials in humans, um, there are different uh, drugs, um, and this is the maximum lifespan. So we found the increased lifespan in certain model organisms, and you know they're used in clinical trials, and they always have some terms of exomatrix gene expression changes, right? Which is pretty cool. But um, what it exactly is, it was not really defined. And so what we had to do in the first place is define all these extra matrix proteins. The proteins that form the extra matrix is called the core matrisome, which are glycoproteins, collagens, proteoglycans, or matrisome associate proteins that actually remodel it, like the MMPs and things like that. So humans have around 1,000 mat matrisome uh, proteins, and the has has around 700. So when we took the matrisome and we went back to all these longevity interventions, so there are um, 47 longevity trucks, right? And there is gene expression uh, data there from the CMAP data. So in human cell culture, where they treated uh, these cells, these human cells with these trucks. So out of these 47 longevity trucks, 41 showed a significant change a matrisome gene expression, which is almost 90%, which is really cool and says that we are on onto something. So to really nail this, we went back to GTEx data and with the help also from Christian Reels Lab, some real cool work where they defined actually the um, gene expression changes in human um, different tissues during aging. We used that and stratified this one for um, the matrisome and half, of course, uh, exomatrix genes that go up with age or down with age. And then we basically use this one as the aging so-called matriotype. So this is the matrisome associated with, with aging. We reversed it and called it youthful matriotype. Then we use this youthful matriotype and overlaid that gene expression, this aging gene expression with uh, you know, different drug gene expressions. We came up around 180 different potential drug um, geoprotective uh, targets. And then we basically used C. elegans to, to test them for longevity. And we developed a novel market that actually predicts longevity itself. We can do this with actually collagen expression. And then we found uh, novel and known geoprotective drugs. 
For instance, one of them is uh, vitamin B12, which you just heard from Manuel Serrano. Um, other ones is chrysin, as a flamnoid and ha uh, honey, and another one is dapson, which is a sulfur, right? And this was really cool, but what is uh, even cooler to us at least are novel drugs that act in the exome matrix. And so these are actually um, glycosamine glycans, right? Chondroitin in sulfite and hyaluronic acid that when we supplement C. elegans with them, they actually increase uh, the lifespan of C. elegans shown here. Now, um, try to pick here, this is, this is a cell. And so for example, this is a collagen. Um, hyaluronic acid is this long chain molecule here. There are different proteoglycans attached to it. And these proteoglycans have these sugar residues called chondroitin sulfate. And chondroitin sulfate is a supplement that is very well known. It's worldwide uh, in use also for osteoarthritis. There are lots of clinical trial. Um, it's pretty safe, right? And it's also shown in, in large core started to um, um, decrease uh, human mortality, right? Just as associated study. Now we think it's called controlling sulfate works through two mechanisms. One would be exomatrix um, remodeling and the other one would be inhibiting uh, inflammation, nf kappa beta, right? And we're trying to follow up this one more closely to figure out what's actually going on in aging. Another exciting part that came out of a screening is another compound, the supplement I can't disclose here, um, which when we um, treated C. elegans, it's uh, sufficient and nicely increases lifespans. And uh, we currently on the midst of patent application and I'm co-founder of this um, Avia um, lifespan um, company. So um, you will hear more than coming from, from the company side with that. So with this, um, Here's the acknowledgments. I thank especially my lab for all hard working doing all these things, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Colin. That was a really great talk. Um, we have uh, some questions uh, online. Um, let me just check the Slack channel. Um, there's a number of questions here, and so I encourage you to also go and, uh, and check out the Slack channel, Colin, after the talk, and then you can answer some. Uh, there is a question that's been upvoted that uh, was asked by myself. Is uh, collagen maintenance equally important in all tissues? It's equally important in all tissues. Um, it's hard. I would say, uh, it's hard to say because each tissue makes their own external matrix and what it actually needs to remodel is all tissue, tissue specific. One cool thing I didn't mention is that actually we can use, you know, in the single cell sequencing data, we can use the external matrix to predict tissue type and, and tissue state. So disease state, or we can development the state. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated and it really depends what the surrounding is. I see. Very interesting. We have a question from Jose Navarro, Betancourt. Type one and three collagen increases with age. Is it deposition of new collagen where it shouldn't be present or isotope switch in places where it, sh where it should be? So that is a good question. We're trying to follow this up. So what we think is actually going on is these are um, Collagen one and, and three, we see, I think they come from fibrosis, right? So usually during aging, you have inflammation and inflammation really drives this collagen type one and three expression. And they are mostly amorph, right? Which is some hard to say. So we're looking into it. So we think it's a counterbalance there again. Um, what we think is actually going on, too much collagen is not good and too little is also not good. So there is like you, like you have this U-shaped curve, you will have the same thing for collagen remodeling, right? Because there are diseases that, like fibrosis, you have lots of collagen that's not good, and then there are diseases where you don't have any collagens, and that's also not good. So what you want is to be in the balance, in the right region there. Great. Thank you very much. So we have a question from Vera Gorban over here in the... Uh, hello, Colin. I was very excited to see hyaluronic acid, of <coughs> course. Um, so I'm wondering if you used it together with chondroitin sulfate or alone? And then the second question, well, we love it in mammals, but I wonder in seligans because they don't make their own, what, so what would be the mechanism of action? 
That's a very good question. So we are only did uh, individual trucks at the moment. So I mean, how do I synchronize myself? And we haven't combined it. So we will, and it's a good idea to do it. And how it exactly works, at least in CL, against we think there's um, uh, remodeling of the axle matrix, like again, sparked on. So somehow this is part of the matrix. Maybe the CL against thinks the matrix is broken and it reinitiates this remodeling, which is completely stopped after reproduction in CL against so after development. Thank you. Very good. And one last question from Peter de Kaiser down here. Hi, uh, wait, wait, Peter, because we've got to get it streamed out. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So, very exciting results. Um, I have one question, though, on uh, the DAF2 model system. So, those mice have uh, the DAF2 knockout mice, uh, worms, sorry. They have a very uh, prolonged lifespan, but not necessarily a happy health span, right? So, they're quite immobile. So, lifespan is not equal health span. So, did you uh, do any health span studies with your Exxon uh, treatment and, for instance, also with your ECM remodelers? So we are doing this at the moment, so it's very hard to work with this very cherry-toric uh, mice, uh, C. elegans, so they're pretty old. But just looking at them, when I, when I looked at the dish, right, they keep moving again, right? So they seem to be healthy. That's what you mean is a mutation in the DAF2 receptor that makes them immobile or less moving, right? And so we avoid this with this kind of treatment. So I'm collaborating with lots of different labs to look at this at different things because I'm pretty excited whether it's just slowing of aging or reversal, right? So we'll see. I hope we have an answer next year. Very exciting uh, talk, Colin. Thank you so much for your presentation.